Hi, welcome to our session about speech pathology careers and all the related fields to that. I'm Nancy Frischberg. I'm one of the organizers of the Linguistics Career Launch. And today we have support from Marcus Robinson as our Zoom producer. And he's also gonna provide useful resources in the chat. And let's go ahead and meet our presenters. We've got two people with us who have I've been working in the field of speech pathology and communication disorders, and I'm happy to introduce you to Chandra Vitababo and to Caroline Johnson. And I hope that each of them will give us a little more insight into what brought them to this field and how they're doing in it. So let, without further ado, I'm going to let Chandra start. Hi, um, thank you all for being here. It's a very, I'm very excited to talk a little bit about uh, my journey and help answer any questions. Um, so I've been a speech language pathologist now for um, five years, and I currently work in the uh, Sunnyvale Public School System. So um, when I first went into undergraduate school, I thought I was educated to be an engineer, um, like you know my parents were, and um, I had no idea anything about the field of speech language pathology. I took an intro to linguistics course and I was just completely hooked. I just knew that I wanted to do something with linguistics um, for my career. Um, so I, I was kind of like, what can you do with a linguistics degree? And I, because I knew I really wanted to do something kind of end with the helping kind of profession. So I found um, speech language pathology. And it actually turned out that I used to um, uh, require a speech therapy when I was a, a, in um, preschool and kindergarten age for articulation. I was not able to say some of the sounds correctly. So um, I was looking online, I found my old speech therapist, um, she's still working in, um, just in Marin, just north of San Francisco. Um, and um, I was able to go and intern with her. So I'd drive over and uh, kind of observe what she was doing. And I just realized that was the feel for me and being able to use uh, language and linguistics, those same theoretical concepts that um, I was learning in my linguistic classes in a profession that would uh, be directly helping people. Um, so, uh, so I, yeah, I decided, you know, I just became hooked. Um, I, I decided to find every opportunity I could and um, in undergrad to um, become a uh, graduate student because I know I'll probably get a few questions, especially if there's some undergraduates here about how with the UC degree to get into um, graduate school. Um, and I'll be happy to talk more about that if that's in interesting. And um, then, uh, yeah, so I've been working in my career, I really focus on pediatrics, so I work primarily with the schools. I've also done a little bit of work um, in private clinics as also, um, and also been doing some work where you can go into people's homes and uh, provide services there. Um, so I think that's kind of the cliff notes of what I've been doing so far. <laughs> I muted myself. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much for that quick introduction. Caroline, can you give us an overview? Yeah, um, so my background, I went to Tulane University and I was really interested in um, French and linguistics. I took a um, French linguistics course and then um, hadn't really, you know, thought anything about linguistics as much as just like I was had a love of learning languages. You know, I was taking Russian and German and all these um, different languages and then linguistics came up and in you know the French linguistics course and I was like this is actually the most interesting thing that I could ever think of studying so I became a linguistics major as well as French major and um, I didn't know what I could do with my degree afterwards um, I ended up um, going to I study abroad in, in France and was thinking about, okay, what kind of career choice do I want afterwards? And I ended up teaching at a um, French immersion school. There's a lot of French immersion schools um, where I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. So um, and Cajun French is a native language of um, some speakers uh, still in Louisiana. Um, and there's a French Creole and, Fr and Cajun French program as well at Tulane. So um, I was able to do some sociolinguistic work there with a PhD um, candidate. And so anyhow, um, I did go to become uh, working at the French Immersion School. I loved it. Um, and then I went and was uh, teaching ESL at with Catholic Charities. And then I decided, oh, I want to go to Russia <laughs> and teach <laughs> ESL there and see right. how I like the, the job scene as a ESL teacher. 
I stayed there a year and um, I basically thought about what's the next step. I, I thought I did lo really love teaching, you know, ESL, um, but I wasn't sure about continuing it for like my lifelong um, career choice had heard about speech language pathology and a biolinguistics, I mean, bio uh, psycho psychology course. Mm. And, you know, I didn't really know too much more about it, except for, wow, that sounds really interesting. That's very close to linguistics. And I'm interested in all aspects of linguistics. Mm -hmm. So um, I looked at grad uh, schools. And when I came back to New Orleans, I applied and went to LSU. Um, Louisiana State University. And um, so basically, and uh, that's where I've, uh, that's where I got my um, master's and then um, ended up at one of the school systems. Here's a lot of charter schools. And now I work at a French immersion school, um, Lycée Francais de la Nouvelle Orléans. So le like a French school of, of New Orleans, basically. Very cool. Okay, so uh, now I think that it's clear, and I think I said this even in the in the one paragraph description of the session, which finally went out yesterday. Um, and that is, in order to practice speech or language pathology, you need to have an advanced degree of some kind. So you both did undergraduate work in linguistics and various other things, as you've said, and then went on and got an advanced degree of master's, right? Yes, specifically, a master's is required. Um, you mm -hmm. can get a PhD, but in order to be a clinician, you would need a master's degree. And that's something that I actually learned when I was in grad school. So I was asking one of my professors, why can't you just get a PhD in practice? But um, <laughs> PhD courses are um, tend to be more theoretical. Masters tend to be much more applicable. And as someone who did undergrad at UC Davis, um, I was not really used to how practical the courses were. Um, so it was really, it, it was really nice being able to um, you're going to get that theoretical background and then the practical one. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Carolyn? Where did you do your uh, graduate work? In LSU. Uh -huh. Yeah. In New Orleans. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you do. I, you do have to have a master's. You can have a master's in science. I have a master's in communication disorders. Um, and it's uh, it's definitely more practical work. You have clinicals and you have supervision um, when you're doing your clinicals, you're supervised um, when you're working with your clients. Um, I definitely agree. It's more on, on the practical side. Um, a PhD would be like leading you towards academia more um, or potentially research, but um, you definitely need a master's. Right. Uh, right. And the supervision part is really important, too, mm -hmm. where you get to, as Chandra was saying, follow somebody around or do the work and, and be observed and then get the critique before you go too far down some wrong headed direction. Exactly. Yeah, 400 <laughs> hours of, um, of internship are required for licensure. So it's okay. um, and yeah, it, most grad schools will do them for you. If you go to one of those online programs, my experience, they will make you find your hours by yourself. But mm. I went to the, I, I was also into, I went to my grad school in, um, in a physical site, University of Texas at Dallas, and they were able to find uh, the opportunities um, for us. Good, yeah. I, I, my, that's my experience is that mostly the faculty in the graduate program know they have to, somebody's responsible for finding practicums mm -hmm. and they probably have a bunch of, um, liaison back and forth with uh, different kinds of speech and hearing clinics or whatever. Right. There's um, externships. Uh, well, I'm sure per graduate program, it somewhat differs, but there's um, you have on site clinics. So at LSU, we had a lot of we had from semester to semester, we had different clients. So, for, for example, um, one semester I worked with mostly reading clients. Another semester I worked with um, mostly language clients. Another semester I worked more on like uh, alternative and augmentative communication. So working with more nonverbal um, clients. And, um, and then after uh, four semester or yeah, four semesters of um, the on-site clinics, you do your externships. I don't know if they call it something different, um, Chandru, at your school, but basically you're going out into the field at, um, I worked at uh, New Orleans School 
oral school for the deaf. And um, I also worked at Lycée Francais, which is why I <laughs> knew about this job that I work at. And, um, uh, you know, outpatient or inpatient, there's uh, lots of uh, um, places you can, you can get work at. Right. And so both of you ended up choosing school age children as your target uh, audience or, you know, the right. participants in the in the therapy. Um, but I think there are lots of other choices and probably some of your classmates took those. Right. That is. Oh. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you yeah. mention a couple of those? Oh, yeah. So the um, saying is that speech language pathologists work from literally from infants all the way to geriatrics. Right. Um, you might be thinking, you know, an infant can't talk when they need a speech therapist. Uh, we work with feeding at that age. Um, so even literally from the day that the a child is born, you can work on feeding with them. Yeah. Um, in addition, there's a lot of work you can do with geriatrics as well. Um, there is, um, for example, anyone who sustained a stroke, any sort of brain injury, they will mm -hmm. tend to have communication or swallowing difficulties. And swallowing is another um, big part of our scope of practice. So yeah, I've got friends who work everywhere um, from hospitals to skilled nursing facilities to home health. And there are uh, a lot of opportunities and the field is growing. Um, and there, it is supposed to be one, especially with um, the aging population and much more awareness of uh, developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And even when um, I was in school in the 90s, um, uh, you know, when I, when I was just growing up then, uh, there's just much more um, awareness. So it, it is a really growing field and um, a lot of jobs are available. Cool. Do you have anything to add, Caroline? Um, yeah, I mean, I would just say like a lot of people might have heard of speech language pathology and the, you know, just the realm of like, oh, they work on stuttering and articulation. So working on the speech sounds, but there's a lot more to the field. I definitely didn't know as much until, of course, I went to grad school about the field. But as Chandru was saying, there's, we're supposed to be the swallowing experts. So people who, um, are having difficulty with breastfeeding, so infancy up to geriatrics as well. Um, we work on cognition, cognitive linguistics, um, voice, so if there's any sort of vocal cord disorder, um, uh, dyslexia, uh, language, social communication, so any, any sorts of, you know, all, all sorts of disorders. So do you think that your background in linguistics uh prepared you well for this or differently from where other places, other backgrounds that your colleagues came in with? I wouldn't say yes. Um, most of my colleagues came with an undergraduate degree in speech language pathology or communication ah, disorders. Okay. Um, I know that, I don't know where um, people from this panel or people, uh, everyone observing is from. Um, I, as uh, someone from a UC, uh, I'm pretty sure none of, the, none of the UCs anymore offer that degree. And you might think, oh, I mean, that's uh, not a good idea. Maybe I should not go into this field because I can't get the degree or should transfer out. That's not the case. Um, my linguistics courses prepared me extremely well for the field. Um, I feel like having the theoretical background of speech production, of articulation, and just of the neurolinguistics has really helped me in understanding the sort of the basis of the therapies that I'm doing. I would absolutely agree. I feel like we had an edge up. Um, most of my um, graduate colleagues uh, were... Um, also speech language pathology undergraduate majors. Um, and so there were maybe five of us in my, in my class that were linguistics majors. And mm. it was, I feel like we did have an edge, uh, um, you know, like we already knew international phonetic alphabet. Um, we already understood phonetics, phonology. Um, so doing those courses where you're actually analyzing um, more, uh, the nitty gritty and you have to do like diacritics and stuff that was already kind of like you are we already had a solid base um, whereas our our cohort in our cohort a lot of uh, them were kind of learning it starting from scratch right mm -hmm. yeah. well and and then one of the I mean this is sort of a niche question but uh, I'm wondering whether any of you has had um, contact with people who have social and pragmatic disorders of language I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, I, I have a lot of, uh, so right now clients, you mean? Uh, yeah, clients. But. Yeah, I have a lot of, um, well, I don't want to say a lot, but I have uh, uh, several clients who are nonverbal and who are on the autism spectrum. I have wow. some high functioning um, uh, clients who are on the autism spectrum as well. Um, and we work on social language uh, as well. 
with the high functioning clients. And we, so we work on like um, proxemics and, you know, just any sort of like, so because I'm, we're school-based, it has to be sort of um, in relation to how things are functioning in the school setting. So mm -hmm. it needs to, we need to make sure that we're working on practical skills that we would encounter in school setting with like classmates, their age and adults. And how do you speak differently with an adult versus a classmate? And let's do a lot of what for social uh, language for the high functioning clients. We, we do a lot of role play and um, um, like video based um, watching an, an interaction fail and then mm. watching it, uh, uh, you know, have success. And so then, then we role play that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, something too uh, that I work on a lot, um, social pragmatic um, with the, many of my students who are also on the autism spectrum. And it's a very interesting one uh, too, just because of um, how it's not as black and white. Like for a lot of articulation therapy, maybe you um, have the child say the R sound, what is the words of the R sound 20 times and they say it right 10 of them, so you know how they did. But it's a much more opaque um, so, uh, social pragmatics um, as well too, especially because if you teach it wrong, some days you might just talk like, you know, I mean, if you just teach them how to do things, you don't just say the same thing to someone every uh, time. And you can tell, right? Um, sometimes I feel like, you know, Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory, you know, he that maybe was not taught maybe right how to do his social problematic strategies. So half the time he does things that are technically right, but not exactly. So I like it because you get to do a lot of things. Like you get to have a lot of fun being role playing. You get to watch videos with them. Um, so and that's what that's one of my favorite um, um, parts of the job is working with some of the social pragmatic goals. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I'm glad I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> now, Chandra, I'm going to guess that you grew up bilingual. Is that true? Um, essentially, yeah. So I'm a heritage speaker of Tamil, so that means I can understand pretty well. Uh, okay. Speaking is a bit of a challenge. Um, and yeah, I definitely took a uh, Spanish in school and uh, given where I am in the Bay Area, it is very much required. So I've been, I use a lot of Spanish, especially with communicating with, um, with the students and especially a lot of the parents who might have more limited English proficiency. Okay, so that was sort of part of my question. And then uh, obviously, Caroline, you've become bilingual, even if you didn't grow up that way and you at least buy. Mm -hmm. how, how good's your Russian? Um, I, I would say intermediate. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, one of my, um, one of my side interests is just learning language. So I, you know, I, I learn, uh, I've learned Chinese and Spanish as well as those <coughs> other language, other languages that I've um, studied me. before. And are those coming up in, in useful in therapy situations with the parents? Spanish or? can, Spanish definitely does. Um, uh -huh. because I do have several parents who, um, <coughs> don't speak English at all. And so, um, you know, we have uh, individual education uh, plans, IEP meetings, um, where you have to go over the goals uh, with the parents and to be able to, um, you know, easily speak with the parents and not have to, uh, I mean, we could bring in a translator, of course, but it's a lot easier because you hear it straight from my mouth. And I know what I'm saying is the correct way, you know, rather than it being translated by someone who, who is a lay person who doesn't actually understand the technical um, language that we might be using. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, French has also come into in handy because oh, I bet. <laughs> on the daily, I have to uh, speak French with my colleagues, all, all the teachers, um, the because it's a French immersion school, they only have one hour of English a day. So there's there is an English program, an ELA program, but most of the days that they have is in French. But um, as a speech language pathologist, you, you should always provide therapy in the native language of the child um, where you can. And I've only ever had two um, clients who are French speaking natives, uh, French speaking mm. uh, clients. But that does really come into handy because um, you know you're supposed to provide in, in their native language. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and yeah, to kind of add on to that, um, if a child has a speech, um, any sort of speech or language problems in English, but not in their native language, that mm. is not a disability. 
because right. like if I was to go to France and start speaking French, I would not be able to get my way around there. That doesn't mean that I need any sort of speech and language services. So, um, so it's always is that um, you have to um, assess when you because um, you can't just um, take a student on. You have to assess them, and I could talk a little bit more about that as needed. Uh, you should be you should always have either an interpreter or yourself should be um, uh, in their uh, it should be in their native language and. And also that's been helped, it's been really helped with my linguistics background because um, there's been some times too where like um, uh, I've had clients who have, who don't use various grammatical forms. Like one, like I think it was a Korean speaker didn't mark the past tense in some words and also didn't say the TH then. And I was doing a lot of research on that and Korean doesn't necessarily do that. So because of that, I was able to show uh, to the, uh, IEP, the IEP individual education plan team and the parents saying that there's no disability, it is a language learning issue. And, uh, and that is very important because um, uh, especially historically um, in, in California and I believe nationwide, uh, kids of minority backgrounds have been over-identified for speech and language right. services and special education services. So um, it's a really profound thing what we're saying is because what we're, like, what we're saying is I know our services are nice to have, but we're saying that the child has a disability and it's a really profound thing to think about. And you have to be really selective about who you take because of right. this effect. Yeah, there's a, it's a difference versus disorder and you do have to analyze and make sure because a lot of teachers will say, oh, well, they don't, they're not, you know, especially in a French immersion program. Okay, their first language, uh, let's say is Arabic. And then uh, they have, they're learning French as their, um, as their cool second language. language. Right. And so then there's that third language of English. Well, maybe the ELA teacher is referring and also the French teacher is referring. Well, you really have to make sure that you are assessing, um, is this a difference or, or disorder? And in the, in the case of this child or many of the kids um, Chandra is speaking of, you would just get ESL services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And that isn't you. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't do that. I actually just got that in a meeting uh, right before, in the last week of school. Uh, mm -hmm. A parent was saying, my child, uh, you know, we just moved here. They don't speak very good English. Can, uh, can you help with that? And I said, if they have a speech and language, if they have a speech and language impairment, I'll help with the impairment. I'm not here to teach English. And um, that is something that, um, yeah, you're going to definitely see a lot if you work in the schools. Um, and notice, especially over the past few years, and if ever someone comes from another country, they're always immediately referred. And, and just and that's just something too, we have to do a lot of, we don't just work with the kids. You have to educate the parents and the teachers a lot. And that is mm -hmm. a, something that, yeah, I might not have expected to do as much as uh -huh. I, yeah, when I'm doing it this time, but it's um, yeah, always something new every day. <laughs> well, that was good. Cause I was going to say what mm -hmm. kind of a career path is there. And mostly I think it's, you stay in the same role, but you might, feel like you're getting better at certain parts of it. But you've got a lot of variety there anyway, because you've got the kids, the parents, the instructors besides yourself yeah. and all the school services to be negotiating. So yeah. a lot of variety. And yeah, and yeah we can also um, uh, move up. Uh, a lot of people, if they want to, can move up into more school administrative roles mm -hmm. if you want to get in there. And yeah, um, there's a lot of uh, more responsibility, but also a lot more money. Mm, that's true okay special right. special education director yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay good that's a, that's a good point to make thank you I forgot about that part yeah. <laughs> but I would also say you can make more money in hospitals or uh, clinics mm -hmm. um, you know it, education is definitely more about like the love of your your clients and why you you wanted to be in this field um, like which which field you prefer but you can definitely move sideways and nothing is, uh, you know, you're not stuck in education if you go into education for your first job or. Okay, so that's, that was my next question. It's like, okay, I've done school kids for the last 12 years. Right. Uh, maybe I should think about moving into some other client base. That happens, yeah. Geriatric, mm -hmm. hospital, whatever. Right. Yes. So there is that lateral uh, movement possible. Right. So basically you need your, um, your masters, you need those 400 clinical hours plus supervise. Mm -hmm. um, you have to take your praxis, which is a national examination. You have to have your, then you get your state license and then you have an, a national license, which means that you've been supervised for a clinical fellowship over a year um, and mentored um, over the year. So you're basically seeing your clients normally 
um, and pay, being paid, you know, at your uh, at the normal rate, but then you're also having that mentorship for one year. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically you're, you're open to a lot of jobs, you know, the, like Chandru said, it's a growing field. So there's, I think 25% growth every year. It's just wow. really like, um, or maybe it's from, you know, maybe, maybe over the next five years, but it's, it's one of the growing fields. Um, all the subspecialties, I mean, is, uh, are school jobs growing as well as elder jobs, you know, or where elders are your clients? It is my understanding that all of them are growing um, yeah. at, at essentially the same rate. I mean, just based on the fact that like, I mean, I work in a, up in the Bay Area and it's, um, and we are at a place that they, the compensation is pretty good, I would say. Um, yeah, like it's not, I mean, you probably would make more if you were like a, at Goldman Sachs, but it's, you know, pretty good for um, <laughs> what, what, what we are doing. Yeah. Um, and so, and we are still having trouble finding people. Um, I get uh -huh. calls from recruiters like uh, pretty much every day. It's uh, like, that's only people who call me these days. <laughs> and then, yeah, I was just talking to like someone, you know, and I just did the community and then they were saying, oh yeah, I now run a bunch of skilled nursing facilities. If you want a, a job just uh, on the weekends or something, you can have it. So wow. I, uh, personally, I feel like um, I've been very, I feel like I've been very fortunate and very privileged to have this kind of job where there's this much career opportunity. And I've seen this everywhere because I did my um, master's work in Texas. Everyone I know there had jobs and everyone and like people moved for either family or just because of where they wanted to be. And you right. can find a job anywhere you want to go. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I, I would just second all that he um, that he said, you can, you know, go into any sort of realm that you want to all across the U.S. There's always jobs available and there's a shortage of speech language pathologists so they're always looking and um, people, you know, after I already had my job, I ha still had people calling me, oh, do you want to apply for this job? Mm -hmm. We need speech language pathologists. I'm like, no, I already have a job. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, and also if like there's someone <laughs> who's thinking, I don't even know what I want to do. Well, first of all, I mean, if you guys are all undergrads, you should probably take some classes, do some video trips, and then see if you like that. But if you're see which one you like more. But if you don't really know or you still just think everything is that appealing, if you work in more of the rural areas, you will be seeing everything. Like um, I've got two friends. One worked up in Anchorage, or not even Anchorage, I think one of the smaller towns in Alaska. And okay. One worked up in Sonora, California, sort of by um, a, bit, a bit out of Yosemite, um, kind of in that foothills area. And there in those hospitals, you see everything. Like a stroke patient comes in, you work with them. And then next time you work with like a five-year-old who can't say the L sound. So there are opportunities to just do everything as well as um, as well as kind of specialize. And I also know some people are like, I just work with childhood practice of speech and that's all I do. So you can really choose the extent of what you want to work on as part of your scope, yeah. And and I think there are some people who are in private practice also and just get <laughs> referrals, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. I did that for a while. Um, uh -huh. uh, yeah, and kind of still do that. So you can either work with an established clinic. Uh, yeah, and then those are pretty nice. Um, the advantages for that, as opposed to schools, are that you get less clients and you get to work with them individually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but then you also might not get the same amount of hours, but depending on where you are, you will get um, a lot of those. And, and then, yeah, the parents will also love you a lot too because they're paying for you. Schools mm -hmm. are free. And as you know, if it's something is free, you don't think it's as good. Mm. That's well, yeah. I, feel, I feel like the parents, uh, I, it might depend on the school, but yeah, I think the parents are usually very supportive, yeah, but yeah. it is true. Like you have more of an individual, you know, um, rapport with the, you are able to work one-on-one -on -one for an hour versus mm -hmm. school. You have a group of maybe three, four kids and you're all working on, okay, the same goal of articulation, but you know, this child is more severe. This child is more mild you're still you still need to group them and make sure that you know the scheduling is one of the hardest things in the school setting is because you know the second graders are on the schedule and the first graders are on the schedule and you have to like make sure that you're pulling when it's appropriate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes um and i would say that too 90 percent of the parents that i have and the student are, are very respectful and they're very grateful for the service they're having but as you know, there's always going to be, you, you cannot, you know, you cannot be friends with everyone. So, and a lot of times you'll just see um, what they say is like the five stages of grieving, which uh, apparently were just completely made up. I just learned about this on a podcast yesterday. Um, like you will see those five stages for parents as well too, because uh, 
lot of times, especially the more severe students that you have, or mm -hmm. even too, like, you know, when um, maybe someone's parent has a stroke, the stroke, they're going to be grieving for them as well, too. So um, there's a lot of kind of that level of um, kind of emotional labor that you may have to do as well, too. But that can be nice, too, especially when you kind of when you kind of they're supporting them on this uh, very unique journey. So that, mm -hmm. that's an interesting point. Now, how much of uh, prep have you had for handling the emotional labor that comes with the, <laughs> the grieving of the loss? I mean, I, I'm very familiar with this because I worked in deafness for a long time mm -hmm. and I'm a signer and, you know, I'm not sad about somebody being deaf, but I've met the parents who mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. had to come to terms with my child has this hearing loss. They never had it. So it's not really a loss at one level, yes. but you know, they're dealing with a, a lack of hearing in a society that doesn't really appreciate that. And, uh, and, and my child is not like me because I'm not deaf. And right. so, you know, there, is this gonna cause a rift between this close parent relationship that I'm expecting to have and here I can't communicate with my kid. So mm -hmm. I'm familiar with that whole business of dealing with the loss, coming to some level of acceptance and so on. Mm -hmm. but more from the point of view, of, I'm familiar with the point of view of a child who's now an adult and is still trying to help their parent realize this is normal for me and this is fine and I'm doing okay. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, I will say my background at, at my school, um, I'm sure it's different than, you know, in each grad program, but I did not feel uh, like we had a lot of counseling. Mm -hmm. Um uh, I mean, we didn't really have that much uh, preparation. Yeah, pre preparation, and it's just something that, you know, as as an empathetic person, you can understand, you know, how a parent might be feeling, and it is mm -hmm. it is really important to be able to put things softly. And there is some, there are, you know, sometimes where it's a lot of education, and maybe there's not that ex acceptance. Um, you know, like I've had parents who have said, my, my child does not have a disorder. My child does, is, does not have a developmental disorder. My child is not on the autism spectrum. There's yeah. nothing wrong with my child and just being gentle. And, you know, of course, maybe one parent is a little bit more receptive than another and just making sure that um, they're understanding that we're here to support and not to, um, you know, blame or label. Yeah, yeah. Label. This label isn't to dismiss. This yeah. is help us decide how do we proceed right exactly yeah yeah right yeah. that's a hard message to be able to deliver in and be heard <laughs> i think right yeah so i want to encourage people in the audience to join in the conversation here we've been having fun without you for the last half hour so <laughs> please come and ask questions of our guests or make your own comments Alfonso, are you ready? Come off mute. Okay. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question, for the for the um, information that you provided. I have a question. Um, you mentioned these four hundred hours of training, clinical training that you need to have. Um, how much time, you know, taking time as a unit of measure here, would that take? Or for your case, in your your particular cases, how much did that take? So, um, if I'm understanding the question right, like just how I guess like how many semesters or so would it take to get those 400 hours? Um, I was able to do that in um, my uh, in two years, so four semesters, uh, including summers, and um, it, because the classes are scheduled in a way that you would have time for that. So, like what I do is normally I'd go and intern for three or four hours a day. And then go, um, and then after that, go and take classes in the afternoon. And then I even had time for other things. Like I, you know, was able to do some work study as well too, um, to help make some cash during grad school. Um, and then the final semester that I had was our internship semester. So what they had was actually where, for two days out of the week, I just was full time working. So I basically was in a school full time there um, from the day that they, for basically from the day that they showed up or the time that the uh, SLP showed up there to the time that they left. So that day I didn't, uh, that semester, my classes were on other days um, and uh, I would just spend those days working. But yes, um, if you were in a program, especially one with the physical location, they will schedule it around so that you are able to get your hours in time mm -hmm. to graduate. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree with that. Um, we, we did have the summers on, so you were working through the summers as well and taking classes as well. So the first um, couple semesters are a little lighter with the, the, you know, your caseload. So maybe you have five clients and you're really working on those five clients. And then the next, in the next semester, you're going to have 10 clients and then so on. And then by the time you go to Chandra calls those internships. Um, I had externships. I don't know if it's just we were in different settings. Yeah, you not... say tomato, I say tomato. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. So in the different settings, you you're working. Um, you're taking classes maybe at night, um, but you're working during the day and able to. And my situation, it was four days a week, but it just depends. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our pleasure, yeah. We also got a question in the chat about what were the requirements on entry to your graduate program? I just put a spreadsheet that I made. It's a tiny bit out of date, uh -huh. um, uh, but yes, I, this is the one that I used when I was looking at various grad schools to get into. Very and nice. um, I'm assuming that uh, the people here are um, linguistics graduates from like probably UC Berkeley or probably a place that doesn't require. Um, all these, uh, you'll probably see a bunch of <coughs> courses that make no sense to you because I used the UC Davis um, uh, <laughs> coursework. But yeah, so basically, um, in order to get into a grad program, you just need a degree in something for most programs. And um, I don't know if you want me to go into kind of the differences between extended masters and postback programs. Um, I could do that. And so basically, uh, I am assuming that here everyone is getting a linguistics degree, um, and I'm assuming from uh, Berkeley uh, uh, or just uh, Berkeley Davis, any UC. So uh, it's not only UCs. This oh, is a yeah. nationwide program, and in fact, we have people sitting here from other countries. Okay. But we're we're always talking from the point of view of the U.S., except when otherwise spoken. Right? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So basically, if there's anyone here who has a degree in communication disorders. You can just completely ignore this. Um, you will be able to just get into any grad school program without having to do any extra work. Um, for, <laughs> yeah. But for the rest of us um, who have a linguistics degree and mm -hmm. weren't able to either double major or minor or anything like that, there are a couple of options that you have. Um, one of them is um, basically um, you, uh, you go into a program and you spend an extra semester there. Uh, that's basically what I did. Um, so my degree was in linguistics, so I spent a semester beforehand, um, before I actually took a lot of grad classes, just taking all these undergrad classes that weren't offered at UC Davis, like anatomy and physiology of the speech and hearing mechanism. Another one was like the serving communication disorders, another one was speech science. And a lot of the courses that we do need as part of um, being a speech science pathologist are things that are offered at a lot of schools, including phonetics. Um, a lot of um, language development, um, uh, like uh, basically um, life science development, you have to take a little bit of biological sciences as well, and, uh, and, and some of these kind of things as well. We'll also link another uh, PowerPoint presentation that I made talk a bit more about this. Um, so what you could do is you can take them in your grad program, or if your um, GPA might not be the best, which I um, fully understand mine was also not to, that whole um, engineering, in, in the whole year as an engineering major really, was not the best for my grades. You might want to uh, spend some time taking a, um, uh, a post -back ring. So that's where you go to another school. You can either do this online um, at Utah State or you could go up to Portland if you want to be a Portland hipster or whatever and uh, go up there. You can, um, you, can do it, you can do it up there. And um, you just take a year of courses, you get your GPA up and then you apply it to a um, master's program like that. Those are the two main options. Um, I talk a bit more about that in that spreadsheet that I just linked over there to you. So right. in my master's program, they, we had a, um, a on op, there were two routes. There was a background, for, uh, students with the background of communication disorders who had an undergraduate in communication disorders. And then there was a non-background and I was non-background. Mm -hmm. So same, we, I just had to take an extra semester beforehand and like intro to communication disorders and um, you know, like our, uh, phonetics, I believe, and anatomy, certain um, courses. And if you had a good, um, uh, you know, good enough GPA, I think you have to have an A average, um, then you, then you just move on. 
Oh, and Janice says uh, volunteering and shadowing hours are not required in the U.S. I can't speak to this as someone who has not practiced outside of the U.S. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's talking so, about, she's sitting in Canada and she's oh, talking I, about coming to, back to the U.S. or coming to the U.S. I, mean, I can't remember. If she's we had to do observations, on-site observations um, during our graduate study. So we had to do an observation, then we would write up a report we would look at the what the the um, client was working on with the therapist, um, and then you know did did the therapist work on the goals, um, and you know what we could see. So we did an observation report for for each of the um, the kids that we observed or adults that we observed. Um, I don't remember how many hours we had to observe, but so yeah, there was that- definitely. Does yeah. that fit with the 400? Is that it part does, of the observation? Yeah. Oh, I, I just realized I misread the question. Sorry about that, Janice. Um, yeah, so you do have to, um, you have to shadow, um, I believe, um, we co- well, we all call that different things, but the 400 hours, my understanding was 25 of them have to be just shadowing where you don't do any therapy. Mm-hmm. And those, you can even do them in undergrad as well. So yeah, so, so those are part of the requirements and your grad program will um, help you with that. So if you don't have... Um, and if you don't have them already, they will get them for you. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. That you know, you now you say that that sounds right. So yeah, three hundred seventy-five have to be your own work, and then twenty-five. So you could you could do on-site observation, or you could do off-site observation where you're, um, you know, in mm-hmm. any sort of setting. If you're interested in working with um, uh, deaf education, or if you're interested in working on, you know, start, you know clinicals, clinics that work only on stuttering or something. Right, or, or going to the VA and working there right, with yeah. veterans who've had speech issues as a result of traumatic brain injury, right. for example. Unfortunately, we're spreading that uh, disorder a lot more because we keep getting in wars where there are brain injuries, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's not a great thing, but anyway. Okay, now uh, she says, yeah, in Canada, you need volunteer hours to get into the speech path school. Yeah. I want to say a few schools do, but it, it doesn't hurt. If you can get volunteer hours, just get them. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think actually volunteer, so that can set you apart. You know, as a have, having an undergraduate in uh, linguistics, that can set you apart and get you into a program. So especially if maybe you're, you're um, maybe if your GPA wasn't um, super, maybe it was a B average or something, um, if you show that your your interest is real and you've gotten observation hours and you've um, uh, put that on your application, then that would give you an edge up. Um, how has your work changed because of COVID? Yeah, so um, you know, we kind of moved to the remote learning, uh, fully remote learning in March of 2020, um, because I, I think that's when sort of um, I, we sort of kind of was like shutting down um, in-person learning. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, so uh, with that, we sort of, we just did teletherapy. Towards the end, I was doing um, teletherapy for the vast, uh, pretty much all the students. Um, so I moved to Zoom. And um, uh, there's definitely a lot of students who could do it. Like a lot of our, my older kids who are working on articulation or maybe language goals, they were able to manage um, uh, their learning pretty well. And, uh, or some days their parents could just set up a, a computer with them and then they could and uh, the parents could do something else for a lot of the lower functioning kids they had or the more um ones with the more nonverbal, uh the ones who had more behavioral needs mm. we'd have to have the parents basically help kind of like as their assistant so there's a lot more opportunities for parent education than you get normally um in, in this same year um so, so so that was it um, i feel like i worked just as hard if not harder being um, remote um, as opposed to working in person. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I, it was, um, and we also returned to person right after I got two weeks post my uh, second shot. And um, it was, uh, it, it was, it has been interesting working with the uh, students again, um, but we, it also didn't feel like completely 100% normal um, mm-hmm. because um, we had to wear masks and distancing. And uh, also for a while when we're in, whatever that tier was, maybe the orange tier, whatever the tiers were, we couldn't see students from different cohorts. And as Carolyn will tell you, um, you probably agree with me, uh, it is uh, next to impossible to maintain a schedule 
just with students in the same class. Sometimes, uh -huh. you know, oh yeah, teacher, like, you know, I have a second grader working on the R sound from teacher X, and then the, another one on teacher Y, like they're never on together. So, um, so, so that's what that made it a bit challenging. And we'll see what happens next month. I don't know. I, I know they really want a, a physical, full physical reopening. Um, we'll see with the Delta variant, but if, I mean, personally, I feel last year, this time last year, I was, uh, and I thought going back was completely unsafe, and at least now for staff, it's probably going to be okay. Let's we'll see what happens for students. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, uh, yeah, we shut down the schools in, in March, and so we were doing virtual services. Um, they were sh of shorter duration. I have I don't know what your case load looks like, but I have uh, over 65 to 70 clients. Um, and it is impossible in <laughs> one week to keep this hours and not be able to group them. And, um, and so I did more individual sessions, but of shorter duration. And actually I saw a lot of improvement, especially for my articulation clients, um, because um, you're, I was doing what's called five minute articulation. And as study research shows that if you do um, more frequent, uh, shorter duration therapy and articulation that you'll see more improvement. So I saw a lot of kids actually be able to um, uh, get out of speech, you know, uh, graduate from speech, we'll say. Um, However, I did see the flip side of a lot of, there was a lot of um, difficulty with access. So maybe we couldn't, we, we just weren't reaching a parent. We tried calling, we tried emailing, you know, we still need to get these services. Some uh, parents didn't have uh, access to internet. Our school was providing free um, internet, like Wi-Fi hotspots and, um, and, you know, technology so that they could, but then that was a little slow to, to coordinate. And um, so th there were just a lot of gaps. And then same as Chandra was saying, I, for my nonverbal clients, that was a big challenge. Um, so I did a lot of just consultative services with the parents of, okay, this is what I want you to work on. This is, mm. this is why we're working on this. Um, let me show you some videos of how you work on this. And it was more of like parent education, actually, um, that I found, found uh, really beneficial. You had a lot of parent buy-in, um, you know, depending on the client for sure, but um, and they understood, okay, whereas you don't necessarily have that time to speak directly to the parent um, during the school year when you have all your kids grouped together and there just isn't a lot of time. Um, you, there's just a million uh, balls that you're juggling anyways. And so um, it, being able to take that time to do consultative services uh, really had a lot of uh, growth for clients, you know, mm. if you work on it at home and you work at it on it, uh, at school, then you're going to see a lot more growth. Okay, cool. We got the very pragmatic question here for all you pragmatists. What's the starting salary for somebody in speech path? <laughs> Depends heavily on where you are. I'm going to say yeah, state by state, right? Yeah. So reach, there's a lot of regional differences. And then I'm assuming there are sort of some specialty differences. Also, you yeah. already alluded to that. Exactly. Yeah. I'd say if you're in the Bay Area, you can expect something. If you work at a good school district, like one that has a, a, a lot of tax revenue, um, then you can probably expect something in about the 70s to start at least. And oh yeah, my gosh. yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, mean, you I need to move there. We, yeah, exactly. I mean, so even with the higher cost of living, it makes sense to be here. I mean, like I was because I was looking for what I could get in Texas. I cannot get this. No, yeah. in the South, it's uh, one of the lower paying regions. Yep. And in education, it's the lower paying range. So um, my starting salary, I don't know, I don't know. It was in the 40s and uh, higher 40s, but still, you know, with a master's and you have all of your loans that you have from school, wasn't great, but I, I was able to, you know, increase that. So I'm um, approaching 60 now. Um, and I've and worked six years in school. Six years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But so it does it de does depend on region. In hospital setting, you're going to get a lot higher rate. So you're going to get 70s, 80s, sometimes higher, depending on the region and the um, and just what the expectations are. Okay. 
So uh, let me just close with a last question about what's the most rewarding part of your work and what, if anything, is the tedious part of your work? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um... I'd say for me, the most rewarding is just seeing, uh, it, it's just, you know, when you get to see the kind of differences, like sometimes when I'm taking some session notes and thinking, oh, this, uh, like six months ago, this child would not have done that. And also came out of this very, um, in a, this uh, meeting, which is um, very, uh, high, uh, very intense case, you know, a lot of needs. And then um, this mom actually came up and said, um, you know, my son, uh, you know, wants to be a speech therapist because you are. And uh, wow. Yeah, and this is because uh, he was also, you know, a person of color as well too, and um, and also from you know a male identifying as well as I am, and um, we didn't really talk about the demographic differences. I'm glad to see some people who are um, of uh, maybe we are a field that is very uh, Caucasian and very um uh, biased towards um female uh you know gender, <laughs> because of it. And it's very nice to see in this um some uh, people who are um. Not, not part of this as well too. We're really having these conversations about diversity, and we just need I mean, a lot of. Like, I think a lot of my insight I have is because um, um is because of my um. In fact, I'm a minority in two ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Never was, thought being male was going to be the minority, right? Yeah, this is, I'm in the one field that I, <laughs> I am, and it's a, it's been it has been kind of it's been very interesting you know, doing this and really it's a good look. You know, makes it was really examine sort of a lot of the privileges that I have and I'm um, really ready to use that. But given that a lot of my clients are also male identifying, and I yeah. think it's really important to, to kind of have these kind of these kind of things that show to, you know, that um, you don't have to be in a sort of gendered job and in a world has changed. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Carol? Um, so I would say uh, similarly, uh, I, when you see improvement in a client and when you see kind of the aha moment of, oh, well, you've been telling me this and like, oh, I just realized I'm, you know, like I, when you see improvement in your client and you see that they can do it on their own, it's, it's really rewarding. Um, always working with like being able to collaborate with interprofessionals. So like the OT, potentially the PT, um, occupational therapist and a physical therapist, um, being able to collaborate with special education. Um, you know, when you work as a team and you're able to collaborate, uh, you'll see a lot more growth and people understand, okay, you're working on this, I'm working on this, how can we like mesh those things? Um, and that, that helps the child uh, grow as well. Um, I would say educating parents, a lot of times I see, um, you know, I've been really interested in orofacial and myofunctional therapy, which is, um, you know, basically looking at the structures of uh, the, the oral structures and how the muscles um, are moving differently. And um, if there is some sort of orofacial myofunctional disorder, having being able to identify and refer um, so that the, the child can get help in that area. Because if there's a, um, you know, a physical reason for an articulation disorder, you definitely want to make sure that you are addressing the physical, um, you know, uh, reason. And so um, having that educational piece. And also I would say the, one of the more rewarding things is continuing to grow. So we have continuing education, um, we have to get uh, a certain number of hours each year in uh, courses. And I love learning about, um, you know, different areas. And, you know, we, we do have to hone our skills in certain areas because, but we also have to be kind of like able to tackle anything that comes our way because you never know what kind of client you're going right. to have. Um, so it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of, um, it's very rewarding because it's not just one thing and you're really helping and you do see the impact and the families are very grateful. Great. Having no further questions from the audience, I am going to say a big thank you to both of you for joining us this morning. I think it's morning everywhere still. Oh, it's just turning <laughs> noon for some of you on the East Coast. And, uh, I look forward, we see, I see there are three spontaneous claps. So thank you very much from the audience. And uh, great.
great. I'm glad that this was informative for everybody. And I appreciate your spending the time with us. So thanks. Mm -hmm.